Good afternoon, my dear friends. On behalf of the Department of English, University of Gorbongo, let me welcome you to another session of the online lecture series that we are organizing. Today we have with us Deepo Vivoroy, Assistant Professor of English, Malla Women's College. It's a pleasurable occasion for us because Deepo Vivo is one of us and he has agreed to enlighten our students today with a discussion on Mahesh Dattani's play, Dance Like a Man. Now, as we all know, Dance Like a Man raises certain issues about gender roles, gender expectations, and gender discriminations. How patriarchy not only bulldozes the claims and rights of women, but also those of some men has been pointed out in no uncertain terms by Mahesh Dattani in this play. So without further ado, let me now request Dibbo Vivo Roy, my esteemed junior colleague from Malda Women's College to address our students. Over to you, Dibbo. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, it is indeed an honor and a pleasurable moment for me today to address the students from the PG department and the research scholars of the Department of English, University of Gorbongo. Uh, I'm delighted, I'm thrilled, and at the same time, I'm very nervous because, uh, number one, I have never had uh, given lectures to PG students. I mean, I have, but not in like this on a platform like this today. And secondly, I am going to deliver a talk on uh, a play which is uh, the domain of somebody whom I really admire and love, uh, Shomi Pendra, sir. Uh, I'm indebted to Professor Amit Bhattacharya, sir, for uh, giving me this opportunity. And I'm also thankful to all the teachers of the department, Department of English, University of Gorbongo. I'll start my uh, PPT. I'll just, I have the PPT in the sense that I'll be uh, talking about the issues and the themes slowly. Therefore, the PPT will help, I think, because that will provide a kind of a visual uh, effect. And that is the basic idea. Uh, discussion today. My uh, talk is basically on patriarchs and deviants, reading Majdatani's Dance Like a Man. Uh, I'm, what I'll try to do is uh, try to analyze the text. We are going for a kind of a textual analysis and perhaps a few of the issues that will come up during this textual analysis that we are going to discuss and how the concept of uh, being a man and being a deviant from that, uh, from the given discourse of being a man uh, have shaped the entire idea of the play. Now, Indian uh, writing in English, especially drama, has... Uh, taken a new kind of a form in the hands of Mahesh Datani. Mahesh Datani uh, was uh, somebody who was actually groping for the language that he wanted to write. He had seen plays which were performed in regional languages. He had seen se several plays which were uh, the adaptations of the uh, Shakespearean plays or the other Western plays, but he never wanted do something which was basically a kind of an adaptation that would uh, be an adaptation or that would not have an original idea. But the point, but the basic problem that he was facing was always the medium through which he wanted to communicate. Uh, in one of the uh, seminar interviews in 1984 in Mysore, he was asked that, why don't you write in your own language? And he said, I do. Now, if you read the book, uh, uh, which is called Me and My Place, which was published in 2014, he has got an essay where he writes about the entire journey of uh, his uh, career, which uh, covers the journey from uh, his childhood memories to the point where he is writing a new play when he has shifted from Bangalore to Mumbai. So the idea of writing in a language which was perhaps alien uh, in the context of Indian drama became the most important tool for Datani. He was actually looking for that medium of communication and that is where we are going to start and also we are going to give a certain quotes from the, uh, the essay uh, my uh, place because that will help us to understand two things one 
that whether the author is actually involved in uh, creating the text and secondly how far he is dis uh, disoriented or I should I, I should not say disoriented how far he is uh, not attached to the text because that is how is he tries or he asks us to look through the texts but this opens up discussions obviously but there are certain elements which are very autobiographical but he insists that we should not see the text from the autobiographical point of view but with his own gaze so let us start i'm not going into the details of indian english drama and how much datani came into existence we are directly starting with datani because we have so many things to uh, talk about uh, about the play so this is general introduction that he was born uh, on uh, 7th august 1958 to a gujarat to gujarati parents and we understand that his fascination for the gujarati culture is evident in most of his plays where he uh, creates the background uh, which is completely a gujarati background but that does not mean that he is not open to the multiculturalism of co of course there is a kind of an amalgamation of all kinds of cultures and that is one of the most striking elements in datani datani is one of those rare playwrights uh, who cannot be contained in any particular compartment, uh, compartment because uh, the moment we try to read datani it is always like new avenues open up severe questions like when we used to work on datani the time in which he was writing this text was completely different from today so i think the entire evolution of uh, the judgments and also the impact of social media i'll come to that a little later on should be read in a newer perspective so datani again opens up avenues for new discourses and new discussions now he was educated at baldwin's a christian institution and therefore english came naturally to him so english was not exactly his second language he always thought and he always wrote in english so english was his language from the beginning initially he had thought of running his father's business but little later with the help of his friends because he was always very keen he wanted to act number one he really wanted to act but why he couldn't act he has given a very simplistic reason i'll come to that so he joined bangalore little theater and part participated in several workshops acting and directions now why he really could not become an actor i think there's a kind of a despair a kind of a lament but at the same time there is an assertion because he is very uh, uh, you know assertive in the way he writes that there were two things going against me my thin nasally voice and my effeminate gestures acting is not about who you are so much as the possibilities of what you become what you can become therefore he understood very well <clears throat> that he had two hindrances number one his voice because voice tone intonations they are very important when you act when you are performing on stage and secondly his effeminate gestures now effeminate gestures have always been ridiculed they have always been portrayed in a sarcastic manner on screen on stage uh, especially bollywood has completely ruined the idea of this effeminate gestures thankful to certain directors who had actually made these uh, effeminate men come into the limelight and produce newer texts of, and discourses regarding this but this is one of the reasons why he couldn't act now therefore he wanted to write he wanted to change the world he wanted to be socially politically and culturally aware uh, and as well as he wanted to make the audience aware of what was being uh, done uh, what was going about in the world especially indian con in indian context so by the mid 89 1980s which is around 1984 he started his own drama group called playpen he was watching a hindi play at prithvi theater in bombay and he realized that the culture of the audience and the culture of the characters in the play were the same now this is during one of the visits to bombay uh, mumbai where he had been with his father and while his father was busy working he just kind of took a little Little time to go to Prithvi Theatre and watch a play. That play was a Hindi play, and what happened was that he understood that the culture of the audience and the culture of the characters in the play were the same, and therefore the audience could really relate to what was happening. Now he also writes why the other characters or what happened when, say, Hamlet or a Tempest were, uh, were being staged on the play, and audience might not, especially Indian audience, might not really relate to that those plays. Number one. they were not exactly the accents like 
we would never be able to uh, come up with the kind of accents that uh, uh, was required. And secondly, it was not really relatable. So relatability became one of the important factors for him. So he wanted to write something which would uh, bridge the gap between the culture of the audience and the characters and the milieu and the scenario in which he was writing. So again, watching a Kannada version of Hamlet, he realized, and I quote, I was doomed. I didn't have an audience because I didn't have a language. I wanted to speak, but I was mute, unquote. So uh, watching a Kannada version, now this is a regional version of Hamlet. We all know that regional versions of the Shakespearean plays. Um, I have seen uh, Macbeth uh, uh, by Shapna Shandani. It was brilliant. But at the same time, there might be again the question of, you know, something getting adapted and getting lost or a new thing being born. But Datani thought that he was doomed because a Kannada version became a hit, but then he did not know how to write, how to uh, uh, communicate with the audience. And he thought that he was mute. He wanted to speak, but he couldn't. So he wrote a draft of Where There's a Will, which was the first play, which was written for the Deccan Herald Theatre Festival. And he writes that there was a very little time he had to uh, prepare himself and provide a draft to the uh, theatre festival before it got selected. And after the play was staged, he writes, it was received with laughter, laughter and laughter. The laughter of identification I had craved for, people came congratulating me for writing something they could identify with. They were all too tired of the fake, fake accents on stage and posturing that went on to the name in the name of English. I, I, I can't just see what is being written here for that sharing thing. But the point is that th this identification was something he was craving for. He had always wanted to write something with which the audience could identify themselves. So he had now two tools which he uh, really employed. Number one, the language. Number two, the theme, the characters, the culture in which he was writing. So with the laughter, and he uses the word laughter three times, kind of, uh, you know, uh, in a very ecstatic mood that he was identified as somebody who could write plays and whose plays could be actually accepted by the audience. Then he writes, to me, there was no looking back. Years later, when I did The Tempest with English director Michael Walling, Caliban's line, and I quote, you taught me language and I profit on it, is I know how to curse, unquote, found a resonance with me. I had indeed discovered the language called Indian English and I was ready to make my indictments on my society. So now with the new tool of communication, he was completely ready to uh, 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 rule the world of uh, Indian drama. So he quotes Tempest's uh, line from Caliban, which we know is a very famous line, you taught me language, and therefore he would profit on it, profit in the sense, one, that his intellectual capability, uh, capability would have been, uh, was accepted by the audience, and number two, economically also the plays did really well. And I know how to curse. Now, this is also very important, I think, because the way uh, he writes how to curse is kind of, uh, uh, you know, is uh, attributed or addressed towards the people who always used to kind of neglect the plays. I mean, also, I also re will read out one paragraph from that particular book where he being one of the uh, foremost writers on gay and lesbian themes on a muggy night in Mumbai was not included in one of the most uh, prestigious libraries even after years of being written. So he was really very sad. And that is uh, the kind of uh, hindrance, the drawback that uh, somebody like Datani would have uh, faced until and unless of course, he is the uh, sole winner of Shahid Academy in drama. And we're thankful that we can actually read and we can stage and we can talk about his plays. So language become, it became important for him and he got what he wanted, that Indian English. Then came Jan Singh. So this was the writing part. And obviously, Datani was not somebody who would be only, uh, you know, um, uh, restricted to writing. He was a kind of a, he is a kind of a multi-talented personality and he wanted to dance. He saw the performance of Bharat Natyam and he wanted to dance and he learned Bharat Natyam from Krishna Rao and Chandra Bhagadevi and he also dedicates the play Dance Like a Man to these uh, gurus. So these six years I spent learning from them were my most formative years, both as a human being as an artist. So this is what this is the background which we kind of realize that as a human being and as an artist how he developed as a playwright. So what did he receive from these dance lessons? Number one, 
the spatial temporal awareness i mean dance like a, a man the play is structured in such a beautiful way that there is a kind of uh, a blending of the time and the space which is very very important uh, and this idea of the spatial and the temporal apart from the discipline that he had learned number 2 here also learned the ideas of bhavas and rasas emotions and sentiments which he could bring to precision and rhythm on stage and number 3 the understanding of theater how the theater space could be used bringing out themes that would try to change the mindset of the people in the society on dance like a man he writes i wrote the play as an aspiring male dancer largely inspired by my gurus though the play is nowhere near a biography the play went on to become the biggest success of my career to date which is absolutely true i mean in 2014 uh, he writes that uh, prime time theater which is the theater company found by, founded by lilit dube had run already for 500 shows till for 2014 in 2016 the theater company uh, celebrated its 25th uh, 25 years and by then 600 shows had already been done and i exactly don't know because i tried to find out but i couldn't how many shows till date uh, have been staged uh, on you know on dance like a man so this is one play that got him success fame that and the kind of identification that he was craving for the play was first performed by playpen at chaudhya memorial hall bangalore on 22nd september 1989 and was directed by datani himself this was the part of this was a uh, stage as a part of the deccan herald festival later on it was performed and taken up by uh, prime theater uh, time theater in 1995 with lilith dube as the director now referring to this particular production Datani writes the play surprised both of us and gained a life of its own beyond our control the rest is history as the production continues to run even today it soon crossed 500 shows which is a rarity for english language theater in india this is in 2014 so in 2020 we can assume that even uh, i checked book my show and they show you know dance like a man but obviously now they're not showing but there is a performance there is this they stage this particular play uh, quite often and we can uh, get a glimpse of where it is being held uh, so it's easier to understand how uh, colossal this uh, success of this uh, particular play was regarding the reception he mentions the audience assume it is the author's own life story as a result they fail to see later alone understand his yes now this particular thing is very important so as i told in the beginning that you might read it as a kind of an autobiographical play and people had asked him even after the uh, performances that uh, is this kind of related to your life is this these are the problems that you faced being a dancer or what are the issues that you have projected are these kind of related to your own life so he informs the readers that do not assume that it is the author's own life you have to see and understand of course his particular gaze the way he sees his way of seeing so it is both the author as well as the readers who are going to make the text He also writes to me dancing singing or performing in general has always been a metaphor for living life to the fullest so these three elements are very significant in writing this particular play dancing singing performing and i chose dance music and drama as my metaphors because i wanted to live vicariously through my characters since i'm not an accomplished dancer singer or an actor uh, so this sounds a little kind of a loss and a lament to me because he always wanted to be an actor and a dancer but he could not be one so what happened is he writes that he wanted to live vicariously through these characters so it's kind of a very ambiguous kind of a space where we might argue that whether there is this autobiographical elements which are present in the play or that he is actually asking us to look at uh, the play from his own perspective or from our own perspective which might make up a new text these are very really ambiguous questions having put my dancing de demons to rest i move on i moved to mumbai in 2005 so this is how he kind of ends the essay and then he talks about the two new plays which he was writing during this time so what happened is this is how dance like a man was being received both by the audience and by the playwright himself this is the kind of background to this particular text which kind of became one of the most significant um, areas of his concern now what about datani's settings when he is writing a play we all know that his setting is always the family family is the foundation of his place which is the site of the ensuing conflict 
all the kinds of conflict social psychological sociological material cultural uh, every every conflict actually takes place within the four walls of his um of his setting and he also writes about society which encourages hypocrisy so these are the invisible issues that we talk about when we uh, talk about the tani that issues which we might have seen we uh, we are pretty um, acquainted with the kind of films especially made by seshotto jitra or itoporno ghosh or apurna shen you know the kind of home the family this juncture this fragmented uh, families become very significant in uh, bringing out uh, the hypocritical uh, conditions and the social uh, practices that are evident in the society so he believes that the audience need to make an effort people who don't know each other join in from all the corners of the darkened hall to applaud and declare the appreciation of that important moment of truth now the audience again we come to the, this particular issue that the audience they need, they need to make an effort because you know there are people there are english speaking people but as anjali uh, multani writes in her book on uh, mahesh katani that reading is basically a solitary uh, activity and even speaking english sometimes we you know belong to the background maybe uh, we have read in english medium schools but we hardly speak english so the english varies and therefore the entire reception also varies and what happens in a when it is a play which is being performed and there is a mixed a uh, mixed audience so the entire reception also varies depending on the kind of the characters and the language that uh, are being used in the play so this kind of uh, the receptivity becomes very important because there are people from various backgrounds with various kinds of indian englishes and therefore what happens the audience need to make an effort and then there are people from various backgrounds who come to a kind of a common identification with the plays uh, that tatani is right uh, writing so let us come to the play uh, dance like a man uh, i'll just give out a brief uh, outline of the plot and then i'll talk about the characters and we'll come to the details later on the story is basically the play is basically uh, divided into two major acts and there is a kind of a blending of the past and the uh, present because there are two time zones one is in the 1940s and the second one is in the 1980s we are introduced to an old house where everything is like 40 or 50 years old and there is also a, a certain um, a hint of modernity in the living room or in the furnitures and we come across two characters who belong to the new genera generation these characters are lata and viswas now lata is the daughter of the uh, two protagonists of the play jairaj and ratna lata has brought viswas viswas is the boy whom he wants she wants to marry and they uh, he has come here today to meet lata's parents that is ratna and jairaj now while they are discussing the play begins with a kind of a set settlement where Uh, Vishwas says that I thought this meeting was arranged because uh, Ratna and Jairaj are not present at home, and Lata informs him that they are gone somewhere and they'll be back because this was an unplanned kind of a meeting, and they'll be back in a moment. And Vishwas again, I reiterate that he says that everything was arranged. Now, arranged is a very important key word in the play because this arrangement is what the play is all about, and the entire play is basically about how these arrangements, uh, you know, get disarranged. Uh, get desired therefore what happens this particular uh, word becomes very important in uh, the context of the play what happens is then um, uh, vishwas goes through the uh, old uh, important furniture the uh, mementos everything and he finds a, uh, in a cupboard an important shawl uh, you know a very old shawl that was there and lata informs him that this is the shawl that was given to his uh, to her grandfather as a kind of um, an appreciation and therefore he used Wear it whenever he uh, was uh, attending a formal occasion, and that is the kind of tradition that we are talking about, holding on to the tradition, and therefore Lata also is a part of the tradition, and he she informs Vishwas that her father Jairaj completely admires, uh, respects, and adores the grandfather Amrit Lal, and he has kept this old house, old things, including the shawl, because he loves him so much. this is where again there is a kind of a conflict because we come to realize only later on that jairaj's perception of his own father might be a little different so in this context jairaj and ratna arrive 
and they are discussing an important problem because uh, they are going to stage Lata's uh, debut performance on stage and the person who is going to play the Mridangam has hurt himself. So uh, they are in the middle of a crisis and Vishwas takes himself to be that kind of a crisis. He says, am I the crisis? I'm sorry for being the problem. And we understand it's not the problem of Vishwas. Uh, the problem is not Vishwas. The problem is being the outsider in the play, somebody who does not belong. And this sense of belonging also becomes very important because within a home structure, within the structure of a family, we have people who are marginalized, who in spite of being you know, staying home, staying very safe, actually are not the ones who uh, enjoy being uh, in the belongingness of the family. So being an outsider, he thinks that he is the problem, but the problem, of course, takes a new turn. And we understand this is a different kind of a problem. And Jairaj and uh, Vishwas interact, and we come to understand that Lata uh, uh, has brought Vishwas so that Vishwas can marry her. Uh, Ratna also interferes. And in the uh, there is a conversation between Jairaj and um, Vishwas where Jairaj offers him a uh, drink. And this is something which is against absolutely in reversal to what might have been the case if he was the son and Amritlal was the father. So there is reversal of complete patriarchal ideas also. And uh, suddenly there is a transformation and this old uh, Jairaj and Vishwas, they change their characters. So the uh, Vishwas becomes the younger Jairaj and uh, Rat, uh, there is a new older Ratna who, who comes into the forefront and uh, Lata becomes younger Ratna and uh, old uh, Jairaj becomes uh, uh, Amritla. So this is a shift in focus within the stage and the entire concept is actually to highlight the spatial and temporal confusions, the conflicts that even in 1940s or in 1980s, things have not changed. That is the idea I think Datani is trying to uh, come to because he doesn't come to a conclusion. And then there is this entire flashback technique that he employs where we come across Amrit Lal and his conversations with uh, Ratna and Jairaj. And then we shift to the second act. And we also again confront certain issues, certain areas of concern, which are slowly revealed, showing how uh, fragmented, how um, there are fissures in the family structure as well. And of course, the gender issues and everything. And the play ends in a kind of, uh, you know, in a kind of a limbo where there is a no, where there is no solution which is actually uh, given. But that might open up newer discourses on the ideas of uh, theatre, on the ideas of performance, on the ideas of harmony that we talk about. So this is basically the play which is regarding a particular form of art that is dance, and how dance is related to the lives of these particular characters and what are the issues that uh, are embedded in the text regarding this particular aspect. Now, the most important part of the play is the title. Of course, we know it is a very connotative title, uh, as, uh, which is also evident in the case of Bravely for the Queen, like that where Bravely is used with Queen, which is something very subversive in its own way. And here there is a kind of a simile, dance like a man. I mean, this is something people would not recognize easily. How could you dance like a man? You could play like a man. You could uh, talk, you could fight like a man, but dancing like a man? Uh, I think even, uh, you know, after all these judgments, everything, uh, we, do, we still need to reconsider these issues in the society at a larger uh, way today. Now let us come to the question of patriarchy. You know, patriarchy is a social system which has always been there for a long, long time and which has been taken up by various theorists to be basically the domination of power by men. But this is not only the domination of men on women, but we have to understand this is also the domination on younger men in the family. I mean, when there is power, we all try to dominate. The elder ones try to dominate the younger siblings, uh, the parents, anybody who is elder in the family, there is a kind of a power structure which is always there inside the family, inside in, in our society. And these relationships, these entire social customs of uh, in influencing the power becomes the dominant uh, I, uh, characteristic of patriarchy, which is, you know, patriarchy is carried out through the institution of family because family, as we know, is the sociological uh, unit where the entire process of socialization begins. It is first the family, then it is the peer group, the kindergarten, schools and colleges, and slowly we are into the larger uh, arena of society. So it is basically the family and the entire uh, idea of the socialization therefore develops 
in the family itself where men they are taken to be the provider the procreator and the preserver of values something which we might not um, agree with but something which is there evident and there are people who try to change these things and this is where the question of the deviance come in the forefront sheila ruth in her essay the dynamics of patriarchy has defined the patriarch who should not only be brave but never timid so the idea is he has to be brave and never timid not only independent but never needful not only strong but never weak committed to victory in battle which is his first priority he is a man of constraint and restraint for violent emotions of any kind might deter him from his rationally designed course on tragedy now when we look about the, uh, when we talk about these uh, patriarchs i mean i always have this idea of amresh puri coming to my mind who is the you know uh, epitome of the patriarchal figure in hindi cinema somebody who is not only brave independent strong but some somebody who always thinks that everything in life is basically equated with battle you have to win it or you will lose the battle so this idea is very evident e even when we are in schools and colleges the idea of getting the you know best results that is also the idea of the, that institutionalization of uh, the idea of power being the best somewhere is internalized by everybody in the society and this is how patriarchy kind of uh, uh, extends its vision now kimmel and aronson uh, they have uh, identified a few features of patriarchy which are again similar to what i really read out uh, patriarchy is a male dominated male identified and male centered social system organized around an obsession with control that is gendered masculine so it is basically the control which is gendered masculine because with masculinity comes the power which is uh, uh, which is the normative uh, uh, form taken by everybody in the society what are the characteristics the concentration of power is in the hands of men there is an obsession with control obviously when there will be power you have the uh, ambition you have the obsession to control men and their experiences are taken as standard for all human beings i mean just look at your own uh, homes you know there are times i mean this is something which uh, i can talk about that there are uh, families where there is a, a girl child there is a boy child boy child the guy a girl might be doing really better but there is always this comparison that you know your brother is doing really well why can't you it is still very evident in the society today so this idea of the men uh, doing something which is taken to be the standard for all human beings become very important the last characteristic of patriarchy is male centeredness which refers to the fact that because the world is male dominated and identified our attention is usually drawn to men and what they do as with all the systems of privilege the main point of organizing social life in this way is to legitimate promote and enforce male privilege and supremacy so it is basically the world of men and it is the privilege of the men to legitimate promote and enforce its supremacy this is how the entire idea of patriarchy works john bainan in masculinities and culture he writes that it's a big quote i'm just i'll try to uh, okay i'll just try to summarize the identity uh, the main point here that is um, uh, the idea when we say you know that doing something like a man or doing something like a woman uh, the posters the magazines the visual media the social media wherever we see they they kind of project the different ideas of masculinity and femininity i mean of of course until uh, a few years back uh, we did not have the option for uh, the third gender which is very important because you had to tick boxes male female now somebody who what did not want to belong to that particular uh, gender what would happen to that particular person when you see an advertisement you know advertisements are basically the uh, worst kind of uh, uh, media in which uh, they try to uh, portray absolutely uh, kind of they try to reinforce these ideas of masculinity and femininity i mean i just recall suddenly that you know there was this advertisement which was regarding the vip suitcase there were two versions one was regarding a girl who is going to get married and the other was regarding the boy who returns to his home after getting a kind of a foreign uh, an education degree from a foreign university or something like that now the suitcase has nothing to do with it but the idea is that there was this entire these advertisements were again a uh, captured in flashback moments something like the structure of the play itself and the idea that okay now the girl who had actually won medals in the past 
has now uh, you know to be donned with uh, gold jewelry because and carry a vip suitcase to the in-laws house and the man who has now you know uh, completely fulfilled himself with all the ambitions of life ready to take the wall comes back home uh, very triumphant and then takes on the responsibility of the parents so this idea of the girl leaving home and the boy coming back these are again the ideas of masculinity and femininity which are stereotypical identities and which are completely endorsed by the visual media uh on datani's choice of setting the family setting asha kuthari choudhury writes that datani un un ambiguously chooses his location within the dynamics of a pre existing structure of the contemporary urban indian family which i think we have i've already talked about and we are new, with new realities piling on the old, older acceptable realities his plots and subplots often work to destroy the very edifice in which they situate themselves so there is a kind of an acceptable reality and there is the there is the piling of newer realities the newer dimensions which uh, we try to read throughout the text or the play and how they add up to the newer understanding of our uh, understanding of various issues blasting the given stereotypes that shape the structure so what he tries to do is within the structure of a family he tries to blast the given stereotypes and tries to give us a glimpse of the newer reality in another article which is uh, titled men will be men stuck in patriarchal role nandita dasgupta writes she may have got rid of her meow but she he is stuck with his alpha role for men there seems to be no other way to be sure he may wax his chest wax his chest and do the washing up today but he is still trapped by patriarchal stereotypes and continues to play protector procreator and provider and we're going to see even uh, for a character like jairaj who is supposedly the deviant the victim of this patriarchal society he also somehow internalizes and indulges this idea of the alpha role there is a moment in crisis in the play where he comes up with the with his own masculine self which has uh, been absolutely demasculated throughout the play but this is where you know the idea of the flashback techniques and the blending of the past and the present uh, gets very significant uh, in another article uh, in uh, 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 is quoted in dashgupta and uh, uh, dashgupta's article he writes that we question the stereotype because if you're not in the mold every part of you is questioned if you're anything else you are demasculinized so the moment there is a diversion from your uh, approved notion acceptable reality of being a man or a woman you are completely demasculinized again there is a patriarchal system which works like for a man who is effeminate or who has gestures the way he talks or walks like a female might be the complete uh, you know uh, the he is the uh, somebody the subject of scorn by everybody but for a girl you know who might be a little tomboy she might be a lesbian you know people do not talk about her too much and that is again the kind of it, every, everything that a man does that is taken to be the standard now datani's male characters are in interesting not only in this particular play but also the other plays like where there is a will do the needful on amaginite bravely for the queen etc we come across the patriarch uh, patriarchs like amritlal parekh and hasmuk mehta in where there is a will and we have deviants like jairaj ajit nitin alpesh uh, in do the needful on amaginite in mumbai these are various characters where the men become very important so we come to the idea of becoming a man who is a man a man becomes a man as a result of the sociological processes and the condition uh, conditioning as he starts growing i mean imbibe the notions of masculinities and then he is a part of that bigger uh, circle where he is made into a man which almost echoes that of bovo's famous um, identification that women are not born but they are made so is in the case of men what are the conflicts uh, in the play that we are going to talk about now amritlal had always hated his decision to take up the dancing under the guidance of an effeminate guruji according to him dancing is for women and he describes it as a craft of prostitutes amritlal like all fathers in the society is has expected his son to be a man which is almost echoing the same stance in where there is a will when ajit is a pretty relieved when his father dies because nobody is there to mold his own wishes this is not important this is a uh, cinematic version of the play and within the matrix now one of the most important sociological aspects when somebody is in school uh, happens is that uh, you know men is, are associated with the idea of sports i mean until and unless you are into sports you are not identified as a man that is something which is built and that might actually give 
to various other uh, psychoanalytical uh, uh, approaches and especially the idea of trauma because when somebody uh, you know is subject to those kind of discrimination in the childhood might result in various outbursts when he becomes an adult now within this heterosexual matrix sports constitute the regimen of molding a man as he enters childhood i'll skip this part which is taken from tara um, but uh, uh, i'll come to the play itself so uh, chris haywood and martin mcgill writes in troubling school boys making young masculinities then he talk, they talk about western schools but the uh, scenario is pretty similar in indian context as well in western school boys identities may be worked in age specific ways that may not correspond to correspond to society's manly ideals fascination with cartoons computer games board games that contained high content of violence aggression toughness but juxtaposed but carried with it a benign boyness that it was inclusive of girls and other boys therefore boyness may not necessarily be captured by adult defined and applied category of masculinity so there might be a little even uh, differences that are so evident even from the childhood that your boyness is again differentiated from that of being masculine i mean i won't quote but there is a very famous hindi song um, that actually talks talks about you know being a boy and a man in act the first act amrit lal says that it's bad enough having had to convert the library into a practice hall for you so the library space has been turned into a practice hall and jairaj says why didn't you do it if you didn't why did you do it if you didn't want to so there was no uh, compulsion on your part why did you do it Now, Mrithal comes with this uh, quote. I thought it was just a fancy of yours. I would have made a cricket pa- uh, pitch. Sorry, I'm really sorry for you on your lawn if you were interested in cricket. Well, most boys are interested in cricket. My son is interested in dance. I thought I didn't realize this interest of yours would turn into an obsession. Now, this interest in cricket, and well, most boys are interested. Now, this particular phrase, most boys are interested. There might be certain boys who are not interested. Is not the concern of these patriarchal figures. They are. They go with the idea what most of the men do. Cornell, R.K. Cornell in masculinity also talks about the importance of sports, which enhances masculinity. The construction of masculinity in sports illustrates the importance of institutional setting. That when boys start playing competitive sports, they are not just learning a game; they are entering an organized institution. only a tiny minority reaches the top as professional athletes yet the production of masculinity throughout the sports world is marked by hierarchical competitive structure of the inst- institution so there is a kind of an structure which is again marked by masculinity and developed by sports now how does amrit lal comes across as a staunch patriarch in the play i quote but here comes a time when you have to do what is expected of you the word expected is not uh, written in italics in the um, play but i have just uh, kept it like that because the word expectation assumption these are very important when there is a kind of a molding because the patriarchs or the father figures generally they try to kind of uh, raise their children in a way that they have expected the children to be the entire idea or the wishes and the uh, uh, desires of the, uh, the children they are completely ignored why must you dance it doesn't give you income so again an important element that something which you do because you love to do has to be equated with income income again it can be equated with the power the economical power which is again in the hands of men so amrit lal being a very strong patriarch he is completely focusing on the idea of economy and therefore dancing will not give you money there is no point in dancing is what he says jairaj you fought for power in your hands now we come across amrit lal as amrit lal as a kind of a uh, freedom fighter uh, during the 1940s where and he had been uh, actively involved in the revolutionary ideas and later on when india gained independence post independence he became a social reformer but this idea of social reformer is not taken in a very serious tone by jairaj and he uh, very blatantly uh, talks about this on his face he says that you fought for power in your hands so it was a kind of a smaller section of the entire idea of the freedom so the india the country fighting for independence and jairaj also fighting for independence at the same time amrit lal also fought for independence where the power was again invested from the colonial hands to his own hands which he could implement and execute uh, in the uh, through the um, uh, through his son Amrit Lal, I have no objection in your efforts in reviving the art, but I do definitely object to the people you are associating with. Uh, basically, Amrit Lal says I have no objection to uh, the art, 
you know, the reviving the art of Bharatanatyam, which has again uh, various connotations attached to it. It was uh, previously performed by the Devdasis. It belonged to the Devdasi tradition. And how is, it was equated with prostitution later on due to the uh, interve in intervention by various political and uh, religious um, minds. And therefore, it has now uh, been reduced to a kind of uh, uh, an art of selling the bodies. And therefore, when you associate this dance, this particular form of art, with your uh, uh, kind of your profession, this is also an association with prostitution. And therefore, I have my objections not to the art and whatever it is, but to you getting inside or getting into the domain of this particular art form. Amritlal also, uh, uh, you know, comes in conflict with Ratna because Ratna uh, has been visiting the oldest uh, living exponent of the Mysore school of Bharatnatyam called Chenni Amma, who has now been reduced to a, a very, has been now a marginalized uh, person, somebody who used to be a dancer, but now uh, she is somebody who sells flowers on the floors of the temples. Now that is the, again, Datani's kind of concern with the art form which is equated with consumerism, how art has been reduced to this particular way. And when Amritlal finds out that Ratna, uh, his daughter-in-law visits this particular lady on Mondays, and uh, he again uses his power to control her. He says, and if you promise not to visit that woman again, I won't feel it necessary to restrict your movements. So again, the word restrict is something which talks about his will to execute his patriarchal desires on the people in the family. Amrit Lal again uh, is a hypocritical kind of a person who comes across in the play. He is also in a very uh, uh, ambiguous state of a limbo where he has internalized the values, the customs and the habits of the colonizer, but at the same time shows resistance to it. He is a very interesting character in a way that although he is a patriarch in all his ways in the family, but he is the first one who would quickly wrap the shawl around him no matter how hot it was. He was the first among the educated elite class to shun Western suits and wear kurtas and shawls like these on formal occasions. So you can understand that whether he has internalized or imbibed the idea of, um, uh, of executing the power or authority over the people in the house. But at the same time, he also had kind of, sh he shows resistance through that particular shawl and by uh, uh, dressing up in uh, kurtas and shawls, which are completely indigenous, indigenous uh, markers of Indian culture. His hypocrisy is also pointed out by Jairaj, as I pointed out uh, a little earlier, that that's one thing I regret consenting to your marriage. And Jairaj says, don't pretend it suited your image, that of a liberal minded person, to have a daughter in law from outside our caste. The point is that the play also questions and brings into forum two uh, intercaste marriages. One, Jairaj with Ratna, because Ratna belonged to the Devdasi tradition and Jairaj belonged to a Gujarati family. And uh, second, that of Vishwas, who is a Mithaiwala belonging to the other uh, tradition and other caste, and so is Lata. But the point is that Jairaj says that you have done the biggest mistake also because uh, it suited your image because you wanted to be a liberal minded person. You want to show to the world that you are uh, completely liberal and that you have somebody from outside the caste and that would project yourself to be a very good human being. Secondly, Jairaj also questions that where is the spirit of revolution when he talks about the art form or the ideas to reserve and preserve the art form today. You didn't fight to gain independence. You fought for power in your hands. And Amritlal says that we are building ashrams for those unfortunate women, educating them, reforming them. Jairaj scorns at him. Reform. Don't talk about reform. If you really wanted any kind of reform in our society, you would let the practice. Uh, you would let them practice their art. So the idea of practicing their art, the uh, practicing Bharatanatyam as the dance forms, was also regulated and controlled by the people uh, who were privileged, who belonged to this particular idea that the art form can be a deviation itself because the Devdasis, the traditional form of Bharatanatyam, can be a kind of a problematic. Uh, you know, which can also be a kind of a danger to the entire uh, idea of being man and women. And Jai Amritlal's beliefs are also very traditional and rooted in absolute pat patriarchy. When he, uh, when he comes to uh, realize that about the guru and the idea that gurus have long hair, you know, somebody which is associated again, the long hair thing is a kind of a marker for 
effeminate or homosexual people. To Amrit Lal, his son's decision to grow long hair to enhance his abhinaya is abnormal. And there is an encounter between the two. And this is basically uh, where Amrit Lal uh, you know, tries to understand that he should not grow his hair because growing the hair would make him less of that of a man. Now, this is a kind of very subtle hint at Amrit Lal's fear and anxiety of his son turning out to be homosexual or even might be a bisexual. Now, this homosexuality or bisexuality might not be uh, a kind of apparent discourse in the text, but these are the hints that are given in the play itself. So Jairaj angrily says, this is, dis this is disgusting, you are insane. So again, there is the stereotypical formation of the idea of a man which is taken into consideration with uh, the long hairs. Vivek, am I audible still now? Yes, you're audible. Achha, you're audible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Amritlal's condition. So the second act begins with Jairaj and Ratna who return to Amritlal's house. Now, this is very interesting because there is a point in time in the first act when they leave Amritlal's house. That is Jairaj, the son and the daughter-in-law. Jairaj leaves his um, uh, own ancestral house in a moment. But the act two begins with both of them returning to their house. Now, this is where Amrit Lal shows a kind of a very kind approach, I should say, because he does not regulate or ask them to leave or he does not say no to their uh, entering the house. But what he says is, and I shall be happy if you earn your livelihood from it. If you ask me for money, I shall not refuse, but I will be disappointed. So if you look at the, the kind of... Uh, uh, the definitions given by uh, uh, Ruth, we understand that th this is where the problem arises about the money, that you have to be independent. I have been wise enough to invest my money in the right places, but don't you think you, ha don't think you have the right to all my wealth? Amrit Lal deals, Amrit Lal uh, is a very intelligent man, a very staunch patriarch, who comes to you know, easily comes to dealings with Ratna because he, she has, he has identified that there is a little subversive kind of a manly element in Ratna. I'll come to it later on. So he questions Ratna that, do you know where a man's happiness lies? And he answers in being a man. Now, we have already talked that the man is being just a social construction and Amrit Lal believes in that particular idea. And he, there is a conversation between the two. Amrit Lal says, I have seen the world and I can recognize a clever woman. When I see one, so Ratna comes across as a clever woman who is, uh, uh, is ready to, you know, um, uh, execute certain plans for herself as well as for the needs of Amrit Lal. Amrit Lal says, uh, and Ratna says, thank you, I think. There is another, the scene continues. Are you intelligent enough to realize now that the decision to let you dance is in my hands, not his? So he also makes Ratna realize that dancing performances will depend on my decision, whether I agree or not. It is not in the hands of Jairaj, because we always see Jairaj as a kind of a person, a demasculinized person who has, uh, who has no say in the family. A woman in a man's world may be considered as being progressive, but a man in a woman's world is pathetic. This is a very important, a significant um, uh, lines from the play itself, where Amrit Lal says the woman in a man's world may be considered being progressive. So again, that is the stereotypical formation of a woman being in a man's world can be easily something which we can relate with that because that does not contain the standardization or that does not, uh, you know, that's not a yardstick to be measured with men. But when it, when it comes to men, men, they need to be equated with power. And if he agrees to go into the domain of a woman, it is pathetic. If they do not conform to his despotism, he always falls back on money to have his will established. When Jairaj and Ratna leave their house in the first act to return only in the second act, he comes into a pact with Ratna. He urges Ratna, help me and I'll never prevent you from dancing. We see that Amrit Lal has always used the money as a familial weapon for his own autocratic purposes. And Amrit Lal's pact uh, to, with Ratna to help her career in dance will materialize only if she pulls Jairaj out of his obsession with dance so that he can become a manly man. A very sexist kind of a remark where to make him a manly man and to continue your own uh, desire to dance, you have to take him out of this entire idea of dances and the obsession with dance that he has in his mind. And this is exactly what Ratna actually does. So Amrit Lal's idea of a man 
is uh, rooted in certain structures, which is like he demands compliance, influences his next generation, disrupts his son's identity. Somebody who is um, absolutely in a kind of a displaced position makes him culturally displaced, and there is a clear distinction between gender and the creative artist's quest for art. Now, Jairaj becomes a victim. He is a deviant, a victim of his father's anger. His identity is fragmented as he tries to prove himself as a man, both to his uh, wife and to his father. Ratna also scorns him. You, you are nothing but a spineless boy who couldn't leave his father's house for more than 48 hours. You stopped being a man for me the day you came back to this house. So for a person like Jairaj, he has to undergo the entire uh, pains of uh, you know, listening to the words from the father as well as uh, from his wife. So he leaves his father's house, he's defeated, and he ex uh, Amritlal slowly accepts them. And the patriarch authority is weighed in terms of wealth. These are all we have talked about. Um, I'm skipping this Hasmukh Mehta part. So his uh, patriarchal leanings that he raises, uh, he is liberal apparently, but he again uh, equ equates the entire idea of Devdasi tradition with the women's profession. And Jairaj raises questions about the sincerity as a social reformer. Now we come to the most important words, you know, these two contradictory elements. So uh, Amritlal has been uh, proved to be a patriarch and Jairaj is the deviant who is trying to get away from the ideology of uh, the father who wants him to be a man. Now, how are these two words, dance and man, are related? They're contradictory ideas. Dance has always been associated with women, but these contradictory worlds absolutely collapse culture and morality in the Tani's world. And this establishes Jairaj's uh, sense of being unhomed, that he does not belong to his own home, even in his own house. Normal world is set up against the marginal world of the lived experiences of the artist. And there is this uh, theme of individual versus the society, which is carried out in the four walls within the home. Uh, for Datani, no other dance form has been as fascinating a history of oppression as Bharatanatyam. So the oppression that is associated with the Dev Dasis were oppressed sexually by the political and the ritual functionaries, evident in the uh, idea of Bharatanatyam to be used as a kind of an important trope. Post-independence programs have been taken out, so the Dev Dasis to the purification of the temples. Subversive strategy of the playwright, the ma as in uh, the man, sorry, the man in, as the commoditizer transforms into a commodity. Like we have always seen the women as the objects, the commodities. Uh, but at this, in this particular play, he has equated the man who wants to go into the domain of the women as a commodity himself. There is no actual performance that takes place on the stage there. So this is also something which has a subtle uh, subliminal kind of a value added to it, which also talks about the loss of values, which is related to art. Because although the play is about dancers and dance, we do not come across any particular uh, uh, performance of the dance play. Uh, thematically also, uh, Jairaj has to dance or adjust himself to the entire terms of patriarchal father and intelligent wife. Now, when we come to the idea of dancing, we also have this um, uh, concept of the man and the woman. So there is this very famous quote from Ruth Vanisa, Vanita's um, Same Sex Love, which talks about how Shiva has taken the form of uh, Mohini, and there was this inter intercourse between the two and the, uh, uh, the god taking up the female roles, which is pretty evident in the idea of when uh, uh, Jairaj is going to play out the female role as well. This is also interesting that uh, Datani himself played the, uh, the role of Dolly in a rehearsal room in 1996. And Michael Walling says that because this was a male body, the element of performance was even more pronounced and clear than it was with a female actor. Moreover, the fact that the male actor was able to portray the female character was deeply subversive of the gender norms. So Datani himself had played the role of Dolly from Day Before the Queen. And equating this with the other areas of concern, we come to the most important area as a gender issue, which is basically how gender is basically a performance. And we come uh, to this idea of Judith Butler uh, in her two books, especially uh, Gender uh, uh, Trouble and Bodies uh, That Matter. We come to the ideas that how gender becomes a kind of a performance. Now, this is a very difficult thing to understand, but the idea is that somebody, you know, for somebody, the gender is basically acting out. It is something which is doing. It is a doing, and then it is a kind of series of events that lead to a particular 
deed. Now, the role of performing the gender constitutes who we are. So it is not basically that you were born a male or a female. Now, that has been a debate for a long, long time. But this is a, this has been a newer concern where you are performing your gender. So you do not do not have to tick, uh, you know, male or female, something like that. So your gender is basically how you perform yourself. And this gender performativity is carried out through repetitions and rituals in a series of effects, the way you talk, the way you uh, walk, the gestures that uh, uh, through, uh, you know, that are completely repeated in your body, they bring out the idea of performance. Therefore, gender is not only a kind of social construct, uh, as we have uh, talked about in the, uh, as we know that this is this was the basis of the feminist concerns in the earlier traditions, but the idea of performance of gender becomes very important. And she also critiques the assumptions of normative heterosexuality in the in the fields of social familial and legal systems where we have to conform to the hegemonic standards of identity being a man or a woman no because when you are performing your gender you are basically performing your role as a man or a woman and you can change it accordingly as your wish which is again something which is troublesome she also says that you cannot change it suddenly like today i think i will be a man tomorrow i'll be a woman but that's kind of a very series of performances series of events repetitions and rituals that will actually give you that kind of a gendered text where you can perform your gender so your gender is very fluid your identity absolutely is fluid it is not a stable it has no fixed mark and therefore even today now i can just i'll take one minute to discuss you know if you um, come i'll close the text and then i'll come to it gender performance so this subversive bodily acts are also embodied in the text of uh, dance like a man where we come across jairaj who says that there is nothing crude about it there is there was a performance where jairaj had embodied or impersonated impersonated the, the role of a woman he, write, he says that I danced the same item for Dharmi. A friend of ours arranged a program. The money was good. Your mother was too scared and they wanted only a woman. So I owe your mother's costume a wig. Whatever else was necessary to make me look like a woman and dance. They loved it. They loved it even more when they found out that I was a man. So see, the important part is that the program was arranged for the army. Now again, army is that absolute matrix of masculinity. Army. And if you read, if you come across uh, literature, if you mo watch movies, you will find that there are several sexual diversions in the group, in the army group, which is taken to be a kind of the soldiers being very man. So this is also very significant. At the same time, when he writes that they loved it, they loved it even more when they found out that I was a man, is basically what Jairaj does is he chooses and he performs his gender accordingly. So the idea that he was loved in spite of being a man in his attire or uh, as a woman, makes it more problematic. So these stereotypes uh, are also subverted in various ways. When Vishwas says, I meant wearing a dhoti, you have to get the hang of it. I only wore once. You have to kick it out of your way like a sari. So the equating dhoti with a sari. Vishwas, who is completely, you know, comes as a very, um, uh, not a very serious character and comes with very casual comments he also somehow in the subconscious mind talks about and relates dhoti with a spari so there is this subversive idea when jairaj says that i can remember about uh, uh, an incident which took place long ago that i can remember getting drunk with a gang of yakshirana men with plugged eyebrows and bad makeup which is again jairaj's ambivalent gaze because he could remember the details of the makeup the bad makeup i mean as a man he could easily remember the makeup but that it was bad is something which he relates to and he remembers even in the present which is a story of the past so memory subversion of stereotypes are very uh, are embedded in the text into the text in a very detailed format and ratna uh, in a moment he also uh, in the first act he informs his father in law that your son is going to grow his hair long well, it would enhance his abhinaya. So this abhinaya or the performance on performing gender, the word has been used several times in the text, becomes also very significant when we are studying this as a gender text. Now we come to the another character, Ratna. So uh, this is just a question that is like, if you talk about the fluidity of gender, it is all the manly thing. The manly things are being done by Ratna. Ratna has no definite fixities. He can, she can belong either to that world of um, Amritla or to Jairaj or to both. She dominates the inner world of Jairaj and Lata. And she comes in contract with Amritla to make man out of Jairaj. When Amritla informs her, 
help me to make him an adult help me to grow him up so be making him an adult is an important trope again in the play and therefore ratna is the one who uh, makes uh, um, adult out of these uh, of jairaj so these particular machinations also that uh, she um, tries to pursue the critics and everybody associated with the world of art so that her daughter lata gets the best reviews for her performance these are the things that generally are associated with that of a man i'm an influential man but in this particular play the entire doings are by ratna so the play also uh, talks about the fractured lives the fractured selves the flashback techniques throughout the narrative which uh, um, you know which is an important element as i talked about that it shows that the, there is a change in time there is a change in place but the characters in the essential elements do not change power is performed and conceptualized as a system of relations which is spread throughout the society as a chain and this web of power is again seen in um, jairaj in the last uh, part of the play where he has kind of internalized that idea of manliness the patriarch in him when he is drunk and he addresses uh, jair uh, ratna this is again in a flashback that what a beauty you are is that why you like to dance to have men admire your athlete now this can be again equated with uh, amrit lal's idea that this belongs to the, the entire craft belongs to that of the women because they can show their display their assets their wares so somewhere jairaj even in spite of being a deviant has internalized the concept of the patriarchy itself his dance although that you took it when you made me dance the weakest my items you took it when you arranged the lighting so that i was literally dancing in your shadow etc these are the words that are uh, addressed to ratna in the last part of the play uh, uh, in the last part of the play where we see that he has been completely deprived of his own identity throughout the play and jairaj also notes that uh, how ratna has been a pretty uh, uh, you know she has always kind of uh, implement brains intellect apart from uh, economy everything belongs to ratna in the particular aspect although she has a own her own stories but it is ratna who kind of emerges victorious only as the man in spite of in spite being um, the two important men in the family so throughout the play there are certain thematic metaphors which are also uh, which also address the idea of patriarchy and the gender questions the play opens up avenues for various uh, theoretical discussions the old fashion how the tradition versus modernity occupied by different people in different points of time there is a threshold which is the threshold to marriage the family facade the gender issues performance acting abhinaya there is also an important met uh, metaphor of food you know the coffee making episode is very important uh, there uh, is the uh, idea that there are two uh, times when the line i think the milk is boiling has been repeated once by lata and once by ratna so there is this idea to escape communication you know there is a kind of the um, the idea to fail to represent your own identities there is a failure in communicating what you are thinking the idea not to uh, indulge the views and to escape them is a very important and also there is this reference to the son that ratna and jairaj had who was named shankar and shankar obviously is the name of god the lord shiva and how he wanted that his uh, and that, that uh, he could uh, teach his son to do tanjav the dance which is associated with man so everything comes uh, under the um, umbrella of values so there are there is a typical there is a question there is a clash of values in amrit lal in jairaj there is clash of uh, values everywhere between the new generation the old generation there are severe aspects of gender roles being questioned there are aspects of identities that are uh, being questioned because the identity is absolutely are uh, something which are built every way throughout the creation of the text as it is being performed but the question remains that uh, there is this void that the tani actually comes um, in the last part of the play the void that nothing is what we are so was he happy does the tani effectively reach a conclusion uh, he keeps the conclusion in the end and there is no particular way in which we can come to a particular conclusion because uh, jairaj fails um, uh, uh, to a be a man maybe but in his own identification that we can never reach the uh, infinite we can never reach the harmony that is uh, god in his own identification that uh, 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 you know uh, we cannot be we cannot dance like god this is why exactly he comes to um, uh, an identification of his own predicament and his also desire and the way in the last scene where his house is just going to 
be um, uh, demolished. And he recalls a line that they made tough buildings in the old days and tough people. Even tough people like my father get knocks. So it is only in his anger, in his uh, uh, idea, in his uh, uh, trials of the past, in his memories that he can reproach, he can scorn, he can uh, look at, uh, you know, look back back in anger at the patriarchal figure of the father and he thinks himself to be a kind of triumphant in his own uh, dance of life. So his desire to conquer his father also remains unfulfilled through the death of the son Shankar who would, uh, because he always wanted that Shankar would grow up and dance on his grandfather's death, the Tandav Nitta, which was associated with the Lord of Lord Shiva. So finally we conclude that uh, he uh, only realizes this, uh, you know, the lack, the magic to dance like God, that you can never reach a harmony. You know, Datani talks about the idea that there is always this uh, fluctuation, there is the kind of this flickering moment that always change and we are always, we should always adapt to these changes. He writes that I have learned to embrace change as the only way to survive in the world. And this is also the change that Jairaj talks about in the last part of the play. And uh, Datani being resistant to the forced harmony who peeks, peeks into the protest world of gender and social cultural issues uh, his uh, work, therefore, uh, probes tangled attitudes in contemporary India towards communal differences, consumerism, and gender, which is a brilliant contribution in Indian English drama. So the play itself, in various in readings uh, of the play, can be through various angles, um, not only through the gendered lens, but various theoretical angles, and still, uh, you know, it can pose various questions which might be brought into the uh, into discussion because. Uh, as I said, that post um, uh, uh, judgments and in a newer light today, I mean, uh, the play opens up severe uh, issues which are always open to discussion. So this is the idea that I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Dibobibo, for such a scintillating talk. You have raised certain issues, and now the session is open for questions and comments. Uh, yes, uh, I just I, I would like to before the questions come in, um, Dipo, thank you very much for uh, such a wonderful for a wonderful talk. I mean, it was it was brilliant. I I was listening through through the whole. Uh, of it, I mean, the way you have raised uh, certain issues. Uh, of course, there were there were several other uh, you know aspects that are uh, yet to be to be to be addressed. But it is not possible to to cover everything in in this little time. But uh, the way you have uh, addressed, particularly questions of gender, sexuality, and the notion of masculinity, how patriarchy operates, and how Jairaj is is a, is a victim of the circumstances i mean this this was i really liked uh, your approach on the whole thing uh, okay so so now we can take some questions uh, and the first question has already come uh, priyanka chakraborty is asking uh, just a minute let me just take a look okay this is about uh, butler's uh, you know ideas of performativity and gender so uh, she is asking that uh, our identities can be changed through repetitive performances. So if we try to change, it won't be won't we be the victims again of the patriarchal power structure as divines as we see Jairaj in the play. And so what do we do to stand against the patriarchal society? That is Priyanka Chakraborty's question. Okay, oh, did you get it? Yes, yes, I could hear it. Uh, Okay, this is very interesting in a way that uh, every theoretical framework has its own limitations. I mean, when you talk about gender being a performance and you're performing your roles, this is also very problematic in a way that, again, you fall into the kind of, you know, ambit of uh, the binaries of uh, performance of gender there might be, you know. Somewhere you will always be uh, considered, you know, even in spite of somebody like a deviant like Jairaj, he might perform his own gender and be very happy in his own domain. But in a larger social structure, I mean, everybody is not a theorist. Everybody is not into academics. So the concept of performance of gender will not easily come to uh, everybody's mind. And this will always create a kind of a binary. This will always be there. You know, I think that 
we uh, it is not possible for us to uh, uh, get an identification of ourselves only or based on the idea of gender performance and be very happy thinking that okay the world has accepted us patriarchy will accept us but there is a question today as i was talking about the social media i just think back you know some years ago there was no tiktok but with the advent of tiktok just see how the entire concept of performance is now being accepted by the people worldwide i mean um, uh, of course i have no um, regulation or no inhibitions to say that inhibition to say that i don't uh, i sometimes go to tiktok in order to see how this entire concept of gender performance has become so prevalent there are people who are performing their gender roles and they have the highest number of followers there are people who are scorning at them they are there are people who are discriminating them calling out names but the, at the same time these are the people who follow them so when you talk about a platform like tiktok which is very evident today as a social platform the idea of gender performance you know carrying out the role of your gender and therefore not falling into the binaries or being the victim of patriarchy becomes i think lot more easier i think it is with the time that we have tried to um uh, you know uh, uh, try to blend these ideas together that even the patriarchal people who belong to the so called heteronormative heterosexual ideas but there are this group of you know bisexual people also which is very evident in satani's plays and the idea of being watched the idea of being watched by people you know as jairaj also did so there are hidden perversions hidden aspects which are also carried out through these gender roles like datani said i want to live vicariously through my characters so these people also to live vicariously you know the gazers the onlookers therefore the entire idea of gender performance might be very problematic the people might fall victims to them but there is a larger acceptance today as we stand in the uh, area today with the advent of technology this has reduced to a whole uh, you know to a large extent that is all i can uh, you know confirm uh, yes thank you i mean the next question from shayon shayon gangul is asking uh, uh, datani is using the same actors play different characters so uh, he wants to know if it is to expose the constructed nature of ideologies that they represent i think absolutely yes but again see this is a play so uh, what he tries to this contradictory ideologies that he is trying to portray is evident because uh, in this particular play the moment shifts i mean the actor changes transforms into the uh, other character immediately in the play but again uh, there is a deviation in the form when he uh, when he is say uh, translating this play into a film so the question that also came to my mind you know is that very interesting in the way that what happens when you change the medium you know for a play it is easier because the entire focus the uh, stage craft the dramaturgy entirely changes because it gives rise to several contradictory issues and people uh, as i told that this is the change plus the constant you know the constant uh, the change as the constant as well as you are uh, you know you are, you are kind of uh, clinging on to your past on to the values that is internalized and imbibed so contradictory ideologies at the same time somewhere these have roped in the same idea of discourses they come together and this is easily shown in the play with this uh, change in the theme but what about when a play changes when uh, the form of expression changes i am um, i have not understood that idea because for a film it might be difficult this uh, i think i would also like to ask shomi pendra sir i mean this has been my question that when you change the format because he has also directed that uh, uh, pamela rooks directed a, a filmic version of dance like a man so there were more characters introduced and the ideas got a little entangled so this is also important because with the change in the medium the, this contradictory ideas might be questioned and open to new uh, discourses but yes as for the play this contradictory ideas are important at the same time that idea of internalizing the values which is basically the same even if it in the 1940s or in 1980s the change there is no particular change i think if datani would write a sequel to something like dance like him and today he might come up with a newer versions you know because the context the entire milieu something you know things have totally changed <laughs> that would be a good good decision for him to write today on something like dance like him Uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, well, uh, yeah, we will talk about this later because uh, more questions are coming up. Uh, the next question no, was. Actually, 
at this point somivendra at this yes. point i think the questions can wait because note take is very important in this context so please give your comment on this <laughs> no no uh well yes i mean uh, i would also go with uh, thank you amitda for for uh, if we if you have to continue this well i will i will go with dibbo yes what dibbo has said uh when when the medium shifts it's it's an entirely different ball yeah. game and, and i yes i was also reminded of uh, this wonderful film by pamela rooks and which uh, i think all the students should also watch uh, but but only after they have read the play Uh, but but for a play, I think I mean more than more than this this whole question of identity of this question of this this constructed nature of ideologies. Uh, I think Dattani is always exploring the theater uh, in his own way, um, and he's exploring the bodies as well. Something that 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 these uh, this this shifting roles by the same characters allows him to explore. I, mean, I look at it from a very theatrical. standpoint Perfectly. yes from a very very uh, a director stake on uh, this uh, whole thing because i think while writing even the 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 playwright and the director they they are the same if if it becomes the same then again that that uh, is a different uh, uh, ball game altogether uh it's okay as far as this is no. yes okay so polak actually bolo amita bolo so actually this is very important and that's why i actually butted in and i wanted your take on this because i was also thinking on the same line you know that when you were talking about a director directing a performance of a particular play and when it is becoming transverse it is changing into another medium then obviously it becomes a director stake and it it becomes another interpretation of the text so performance becomes all the more problematic thereby and there is also the issue of pseudo essentialism that comes in here so let's let's go to ponash's question now because he is waiting uh yes uh, ponash was asking uh, basically i mean about amrit lal i think uh, this is a rather straight question that why would amrit lal oppose the devdasi when he himself was a freedom fighter and he fought against you know certain superstitions like untouchability dowry uh, why would amrit lal go against that that is interesting because uh, this is where the question of the hypocritical society i think is being addressed by the tani that uh, jairaj also questions that he is doing this is uh, trying to get rid of um, uh, untouchability he is talking about uh giving platform or programs of regeneration for these people but he is not exactly against devdasi devdasis in a way that he requests devdasis with i think being a uh, women you know he always he said that it is not you know the art which i am against but i am against you getting into that art form now devdasis uh and the idea of women selling their bodies is uh, you know something which is very hard for the patriarch like amrit lal to accept and at the same time when he finds out that ratna is going to meet chenyamma he is totally uh, uh, he is very angry because uh, he equates that his own daughter in law who supposedly belongs to a good family should go and dance in the courtyard of a prostitute i think it is the problem of uh, uh, being women that amrit lal has a problem with he does not have problem with the dance form but the idea of um, uh, being a woman but again there is a very interesting take that if it is the idea of selling bodies that is very problematic for amrit lal but how could he then uh, sell his you know he uh, bought those bungalows from the colonizers and then he sold them at a, a large large uh, amount of money okay. then he was also talking about uh, uh, he is also equating wealth he is also talking about money every time that you you know he asks that doctor to visit chenyamma and says that i'll give you 500 rupees so he is always equating his own um, ideas with money so the idea of selling bodies becomes very important because that is also something which is economical and that might trouble him as a man you know somebody like chenyamma selling flowers or adevdas is selling the bodies for money might be problematic for 
a man that Amrit Lal is, the kind of uh, ideas that um, uh, he generates um, uh, generate as a man, as a patriarch. I think that might be one of the reasons why he is opposed to the Devdasis. Yes, yes, yes. Very much, yes. Yeah, I mean, the, this element of hypocrisy is very strongly present in the, the entire presentation of Amrit Lal. Uh, yeah, so, so okay, shifting on to the next uh, two questions, actually, Obinandan Bhag and Aurobindo Kundu are asking something uh, quite similar. Uh, Obinandan is referring to the line, happiness being a man, uh, though I can't recollect exactly from where is this uh, line taken. Anyway, so in, in this statement, happiness being a man, uh, is it a challenge to patriarchy? And does it oppose the idea of man as a social construction? This is, that is, you know, a, a construction of, of patriarchy. That is what he is trying to know. And Aurobindo is also uh, similarly asking whether uh, Jairaj, uh, in, in following his or her passion, um, although it belongs to different sex, should, should regulate his or her ambition to conform to patriarchy or a powerful authoritative system. I hope you got it. People. Yes, kind of. I'm just trying to, uh, you know, happiness in being a man, uh, the idea of happiness, uh, it's a little difficult because uh, what exactly made uh, Jairaj happy is, you know, is still very open case because uh, uh, as a dancer also, we see that he could not be a successful dancer. At, at the point where he could have been a good dancer, he was completely overshadowed by Ratna. And therefore, as a dancer, he failed. As a man, he had failed in front of uh, the family, the family structure, his father and the wife. Therefore, what actually made him happy? He might have been happier if he had the son, you know, and he could again, having had internalized that concept of uh, expectations that arise from being a son, he could actually make uh, Shankar relive and dance that particular Tandav Nitya I think he would have been much happier. That would have been his revenge. So I don't think that uh, his happiness actually uh, is the prime concern in the play because he is uh, a tragic figure. He does not know because he has never been happy. He has always been regulated. And I think, Shomi Pendo, that second question, which uh, can you just repeat the second question? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> why one trying to follow his or her passion if belonging to a different sex like Jairaj should regulate his or her ambition in conform or in confirmation to patriarchy or any powerful authoritative system. Uh, it's likely, I think it's slightly complicated the way uh, it, has, it has been put. put uh, um, it's difficult because see, if you wish to do something, I don't know, I mean, uh, there might be chances. It's very difficult to answer because uh, if I conform to the norm or authoritative standards, then I might not even ever think of doing something subversive or something very, uh, you know, something deviant. But if you uh, do not, uh, there are issues, there are conflicts which will always come up in life. I mean, Jairaj had to deal with them. But of course, there is again this uh, entire idea of that a deviant like Jairaj had to face uh, problems and that he could not be successful in his own way is somewhere Datani could have actually rehandled the situation because every time we have this uh, idea of a fallen woman or somebody in the marginalized state again trying to gain power against the authoritarian structure, he or she is always being, uh, you know, victimized in the hands of the power structure. I mean, if the playwright could have actually thought of an otherwise uh, um, uh, you know, uh, ending or uh, uh, conclusion, these questions might have been answered in a really uh, better way. This is very complicated. This is very, very interesting and very difficult question to answer because I don't know where the happiness lies. The idea of being happy um, is something which is thwarted throughout Jairaj's life. And that even in spite of being a deviant, in spite of trying to raise a voice against the father, in spite of playing out his own gender according to his wish sometimes, even in spite of being, you know, a very good father, he could not be a man. He could not see himself. He has been completely uh, uh, put at the back foot. And therefore, it's very problematic. It's very interesting. But I don't know. This is something which, which is actually very, you know, food for thought, maybe. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, uh, just a minute. Yes. Uh, right. 
so i think i don't uh, have i don't see any other questions coming up right now uh so uh, so we will wait uh, maybe another uh, minute or so uh but yes i mean uh, you your take on happiness i mean the question of happiness once again I and mean, this is rather speculative isn't it whether <coughs> there has been happy or not that is a matter of speculation we we will go with the text um <coughs> yeah i i really liked the way you have picked up certain important quotes lines from the text and and explored upon those i mean particularly you started off uh with with the, with this first uh, yeah the emphasis on arranged and this whole idea the way i mean now if i'm looking at it the the entire play seems to be arranged from from different perspectives so i really liked that the uh, that was one and later on also you have picked up certain words as as entry points into your uh, your analysis of the themes which was uh, really nice um thank you so much acha acha amitda are i don't think there are any other questions so okay let's uh, in that case let's sum up so in a way the bobby was take on dance like a man has raised certain issues and he has raised more issues than he has answered and which is the real aim of such a lecture because the students are supposed to read on and seek their own answers from the clues and cues presented by the experts that we are bringing for their benefit so i must again thank the bobivo for such a wonderful talk i must thank my own colleagues uh, dr shomi pendra banerjee for moderating the discussion during the in interactive session i must also thank vivek odhikari for hosting this particular meeting and last but not least i must also thank my students who have attended this particular lecture in overwhelming numbers so i hope this will help our students in better understanding the play and certain issues regarding gender and gender performativity so thank you everybody and let's call it a day now okay good night